You listen to this podcast because you like books, or maybe because you like learning, or maybe you just like the sound of my voice lulling you to sleep. If it's the first two, Audible has you covered. Too busy to read? Driving and don't want to run into another dog? Audible is a huge library of audiobooks where people read to you like you're a kid again. And guess what? You can try it out for free. Just go to readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to sign up for your free trial today. Space is a wonderful, incredible, vast, beautiful place. And it is humanity's ultimate destiny. We were not born to live and die in this one tiny planet around one tiny star in a galaxy of 200 billion stars and trillions of galaxies in this universe. Our destiny is out there. And hopefully the books like uh, The Beauty of Space and Our Alien Earth inspire people to want to go and see these amazing places and see what the universe has to offer us. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 16, Sweet 16. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with John Raymer about his book, The Beauty of Space. John Raymer is a space artist, writer, president of the International Association of Astronomical Artists, fellow IAAA member, retired military officer, avid photographer, and world traveler. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right. Hello, everyone. This is John Manaster. I'm your host with the Read, Learn, Live podcast, and I am here with John Raymer. John, say hello. Hi. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm really excited to have John on the program today. We're going to talk about two books, uh, and they're both about space art, uh, two things I love combined. So I'm really excited to uh, to get into this. So John, why don't you start off and, and tell us about the two different books? Well, first off, uh, um, the first one is called The Beauty of Space. And it's basically about exactly what the title is. The beauty, uh, the remarkable sights that you could see out there in space. Uh, alien planets, stars, galaxies, moons. Uh, space is full of most wonderful, incredible sights that humans could ever see. and we decided to paint that beautiful site and put it into a book and talk about space art, how it came to be, why it is, the different uh, genres of it, and put it all in one big uh, book for people to look at and enjoy. The second book is called uh, Our Alien Earth, and it's a book about uh, a little closer to home, space art, but it's about how there are places on Earth that are the same as places off of Earth. Um, for example, um, geysers on Earth and geysers on Enceladus, they work for the same reason. That the same things occur to create these different, incredibly different places. But it's the same geology, the same events. So we compare the place on Earth to the place off of Earth, and we go to both of those places, both in photographs and in art, and compare them and show them to people again, to inspire them, to make them think uh, and want to go to all these wonderful places uh, off of Earth. That sounds great. I, I, I definitely want to go visit now uh, lots of the places I saw. So, yeah, why don't we start off with uh, a little bit about the writing process, and then we'll get into the book itself. So yeah, let's talk about the beauty of space here. So so what was the impetus for this book? Why did you decide to, to put it all together? Well, there have been uh, many books um, over the years since the, the genre of space art kind of created itself, um, but no one had ever talked about art and space in and of itself. No one had ever talked about the history of the genre and then broken down what it, each of its different uh, subcomponents were and kind of defined what each of those were and how they worked and what they depicted. And since the IAAA is the... Uh, you know, the world's only uh, guild of space artists, we decided that, uh, well, we're the people that should be telling that story. So we did. 
and we put together uh, several chapters on what art is, the history of space art, um, who painted it, how it came to be, how it's been a uh, prominent in society today, and then each of the different types of space art, uh, hardware, rocks and balls, swirly, impressionistic, different uh, you know terms for it, and then where space art should be going in the future. We uh, we were the people to we are the people that paint it, and so we figure we should be the people to uh, tell the story about it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe maybe before we go any further, it might be helpful to define space art. And at the beginning of the book, I think there was a, a talk about space art and astronomical art. So maybe define that. And and is there are those are the same? Is there a difference? No, they're the same. But just okay. one is a little more, uh, I guess, scientificy sounding. <laughs> sure, got to have that. Yeah. So what's space art? Define that. Well, space art or astronomical art is uh, it's paintings where the subject matter is space, something off of Earth. Pretty pretty simplistic, but that's basically it. Where the, the subject matter or the inspiration for the art that you're creating is space. And it doesn't have to be a two-dimensional painting where you take a brush and you paint it on the paintbrush or on the, on the canvas. It can also be digital art, it can be sculpture, it can be any form of artistic expression where the inspiration for the art is space. Okay. And then talk a bit about the IAAA since you mentioned that. Yeah, the IAAA, uh, which is short for International Association of Astronomical Artists. Um, it's hard to say, but um, IAAA is a whole lot easier. Uh, it's the only guild in the world. Uh, we've got about 140 members uh, made up exclusively of space artists. Um, just about every uh, <clears throat> book cover magazine article that you see that's got space or something with uh, illustrated uh, galaxies or exoplanets or whatever, almost every one of those uh, images are done by somebody in the IAAA. <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's what our members do. We, uh, we envision places that cameras cannot go, and then we put it down on campus and put it on uh, in digital form or whatever and bring it into existence for people to see and enjoy. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's that's so important and so helpful to get people's uh, minds focused on on science and space and, and what could be. Yeah, no, what so, is. What is, fair enough. Yeah, what is already there, but we just can't see maybe. So yeah, one, one of the things that I really liked about the book is there's just tons of art in it, which is, of course, beautiful. And there, there's art that you're showcasing throughout each chapter at the end of every chapter there's a bunch of art so you know you had uh, presumably an enormous amount of art to choose from here so i'm just a little curious how you curated the book how did you decide what art went in was there any process um yeah actually there was it, it was a, a very difficult process because like i said there, there's 140 members of the IAAA. triple um, over 100 of them are uh, artists that most of which you would consider professional quality uh, so when we decided to do the book, um, we, of course, talked out to our membership and said, hey, we're doing this and we need art for it. And I got inundated. Yeah. So I th think 100 artists, um, each of them having probably two, three, four hundred images in their repertoire, their, their gallery and saying, here, 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 take it, take it, take it. Uh, I, I probably am fortunate enough to, to have the largest collection of space art in the world at my disposal. I literally have uh, a couple of thousand images by artists from all over the world depicting the most amazing scenery. Um, so it was very difficult to, to pick out and say, oh, my God, this is a cool image. Oh, my God, this is a cooler image. Oh, my God, this one's even cooler. Yeah. How do you choose from this fantastic representations? Um, it basically boiled down to looking at all of the art again and again and again. So I was familiar with all, as much of it as I could think of. Then reading the chapter and going, this point in this chapter would be well illustrated by, oh my God, which person did this image? And then going back and finding it and then mm. saying that it does fit that particular spot and uh, putting it into the book. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that must have been quite a task. 
it was a fun task. Um, yeah, yeah, choosing from all the fantastic images that we were offered to to do the book. But uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah. So that was a little bit about the the curating part. What about the writing? What, what was the process like for you for for writing? Well, I only wrote um, three chapters of the book. I wrote the introduction and then two of the chapters at the end of the book. And then each of the other chapters were written by another IAAA member. So it was more of a sense of uh, editing together eight different voices. So it all sounded the kind of same way, but still preserved the way that each person wrote it. Um, that was a, a bit of a challenge and that was also kind of fun too. Um, to, to mm. get these different people all to have one coherent story that went from point to point to point. So during this whole process, w was there any particular moment of inspiration that you felt like or kind of an aha moment when, when you learned something or you found something that you hadn't realized before? Um, the most inspirational thing, though, was not the story of the art and, and the types and the history, but the discovering of some of the absolutely incredible art that was included in in the book so one of the most incredible things the most inspirational thing wasn't about the the story of, of what was being said in the book but for me it was looking at some of the art and, and most specifically um, when when we put this book together i was stationed down in los angeles and artist don dixon who's represented in the book uh, happened to live in long beach uh, about five miles from my house. So I would get together with Don and we would have painting afternoons and chat and look at art and stuff like that, along with several other IAAA members who lived in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I picked one of his images called uh, Anarchy Gap, and it's on page 80 of the book. Mm -hmm. And to see that image was like a great big light bulb going off inside my brain to look at it and go, oh my god that and realize where the image was and how don had realized it and painted it and not only did i get to see it in the book but i got to see it in person the, the original canvas for it and and it's absolutely phenomenal it, it depicts uh, a position of a couple of hundred miles above one of the rings of saturn and you can see the rings laid out beneath you and the planet off to your right and, and a little bit of the debris from the, the, the rings have been perturbed up in front of you. And it's just a breathtaking work of art. And to see that and realize that it was perfect for the book, that was the inspirational, oh my God, moment for me. It was just to, to look at, at Don's image, that particular one's probably my favorite one in the whole book is, is just Phenomenal. Just amazing. Yeah. Let's start moving through the book a little bit and some of the chapters. Okay. And, you know, you mentioned uh, that first chapter written by someone else, but it's about the history of space art, and mm -hmm. it kind of goes back to the Renaissance and comes to the present day. So I was just curious if you had any favorite historical artists from the last several hundred years that maybe inspired you. Personal favorite, um, Van Gogh. Just yeah. everything by Van Gogh is, is mastery, is uh, color, is composition, is selection, absolutely incredible. I just, I just love Van Gogh's art. Um, my all-time favorite artist would have to be uh, Thomas Cole. And the most mm -hmm. inspirational paintings I've ever seen were his, uh, he did two series, one called uh, The Course of the Empire, and another one called uh, The Passage of Life, I think it was. Uh, the Voyage of Life, sorry. Mm -hmm. And these canvases that he did them on were six feet tall by 10 feet wide. Wow. Let me repeat that because just make sure you understood I said it correctly. Six feet tall and 10 feet wide. He did. It's massive. They're massive. I mean, it, it, they're in the National Gallery in Washington. And, and the, the Voyage of Life series, it depicts a man starting off in the first image as a, boy, as a baby. And the second one, he's a boy. And the third one, he's a, uh, an adult man. And then the fourth one, he's an old man. 
and he's riding in a, a golden canoe down the river that represents life. And their mountains, the colors, the, the, the vividness behind Thomas uh, Cole's works there, absolutely breathtaking. You stand in this one gallery surrounded by all four of these incredibly large images. And you, you can walk up and, and look at something two inches away from the canvas, and you can see that he, he put the details of the, the stamen and the petals in the flowers. Even though the canvas is 10 feet wide, he did something that, that's two millimeters in detail, just breathtaking. And, and the course of the Empire series, um, it tells uh, uh, the same kind of story about an, the rise and fall of an empire over five massive paintings. And they're all just breathtaking paintings. The realism, the colors, everything that he did is just astonishing. And what's, uh, huh. what is so important about Thomas Cole is that he was a member of uh, what was called, um, geez, the name just escaped me, the Hudson River School of <laughs> sometimes the brain, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, he was a member of uh, the Hudson River School of, of Painting uh, and, and around the Hudson River in the upper north uh, eastern United States in the 1800s. And this group of painters, uh, Frederick Chirk, Thomas Cole, um, Thomas Moran, Albert Bierstadt, they all painted these incredible, vivid, large scale paintings that depicted mountains and volcanoes and all of these wonderful things. And from that, from their artworks and from their inspiration and incredible art that they did, um, we believe that the genre of astronomical art kind of developed from that because you mm -hmm. see these paintings and then you look up in the sky and you wonder what's up there. And then you look through a telescope and you see mountains on the moon and uh, uh, an artist wants to paint it. And so they started painting the moon and then yeah. painting Mars and then painting Jupiter and Saturn. And, and of course, from there, the rest of the universe. Yeah. Those all sound great. I'm going to, I'm going to look at all those later and definitely next time I'm in DC, stop by the national gallery. Breathtaking um, display. Oh my God. Yeah. No, I lived there for several years, and I love that all the museums are free as well. It's all very nice. Um, yeah, so, I mean, kind of then moving forward into the 20th century, one of the things I noticed, and, and we, you briefly mentioned this earlier, was the ability of space art to put people in a place where our telescopes can't go just yet. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it seemed like there was really a rise of that in the 20th century to go from a, you know, from kind of us looking out to a completely new perspective from a perspective of a faraway star or a th the rise of exoplanets, a faraway planet. Maybe just talk about why you think that happened and, and why that's important. I think it happened because the human imagination always wants to go. It, it's built into our very nature. We, we want to know what is on the other side of that hill. We want to know what's up that river. We want to know what it looks like to stand on that mountaintop that I can see over there. So I'm going to go over there and stand on it and look down and discover. It, it's just an innate part of human nature. We have to explore. And once we've explored everything on the earth, look up at night and see the stars, see the moon going by, see the planets in their strange orbits in our, in our sky. And the imagination goes there and the people want to follow. Um, imagination is a most incredible, wonderful thing. Jules Verne started writing stories about to, from the earth to the moon and then visiting the moon and meeting people there and then traveling around the solar system. And he actually um, had artwork, and, and I think I have it in the, in the Beauty of Space, the first image uh, depicting the rings of Saturn from the surface of Saturn, looking up at the rings in the sky. And of mm -hmm. course, people found it fascinating and thought, oh my, what is that? And Percival Lowell started reporting in the late 1800s that there are there are canals on Mars. That, that means there's water. That means there's people. And the human imagination leapt up and grabbed that. And 
more and more people started thinking about it and started writing stories about it. And of course, if you can write a story, you can also paint a story. And then more artists started depicting these things. Uh, Lucien Rodeau started doing it. And then Chesley Bonestell in the, in the, in the, sorry, the, the 1940s, 1950s. And th these folks uh, were the creator of space art and the sparker of human imagination. Uh, the artwork of Chesley Bonestell uh, is literally, you, you ask many of the, uh, the members of NASA uh, why they got into space and, and wanting to launch rockets and go to the moon, and they can tell you, I read Chesley Bonestell's uh, Man Conquers Space and his series of articles that he painted um, in Life magazine and, and Collier's magazine in, in the 1950s, and that's the future I wanted. That's the future that, mm -hmm. that humans deserve. <clears throat> and space art was the, the creator of those ideas. Right. So it's and human it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important that, that we are inspired to, to do, to science is inspired to follow art like that. And I think we've heard it in lots of places, whether from, uh, I know like my dad, for instance, loved Star Trek and things like that. And you see, you hear lots of, scientists talking about that's what got them mm -hmm. hooked in the first place as well. So yeah, I think art and, and entertainment has a real role in, in keeping people engaged with the sciences. So yeah, yeah that's important. We, we in the IAAA, we, um, we strongly believe that art and science are completely intertwined. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you cannot really get the scientific discoveries and points out to people and, and get the public to understand this new concept, this new discovery, unless you can represent it in a way that they can understand and connect with and feel. And humans are visual people, right? I mean, our most important senses are sense of sight. You see everything. You learn by watching. You learn by seeing what other people do, and then you do it until you can do it the same. You're inspired by the things that you see. And artwork is simply the the most connected, most visceral, most deeply set way that humans have communicated for literally thousands and tens of thousands of years. Long before we ever knew how to write words, we were painting images. Right. That's how humans. Uh, that's how humans communicate best. Art. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. It's so important to keep in mind and so powerful. And then, like you said, I mean, it, it even today it, it uh, transcends language, right? I mean, you can you can look at space art no matter what language you speak and still be, you know, left in awe. So that's a that's a great point. Yeah. So one of the things that the book talked about was the difference between solar system art and deep space art, and I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what what those differences are. How is creating deep space art different from solar system art? Well, it's not really, to be honest. Uh, yeah. The, the depiction, the differences between the types of art is is what you're depicting in it, and and the method that you're depicting it. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, just a generalization. We have what we call rocks and balls. It's rocks in space and the ball, the a round thing of a planet. Um, yeah. It, then you have swirly, where a perfect example, uh, Vincent van Gogh's um, swir a Starry Night, where it's all swirls, and that's where we got the name swirly from. It, it's clearly an astronomical or a space art type painting, but it's impressionistic. It's representative. It's not photorealistic. Mm -hmm. Your rocks and your balls, people, are, are photorealistic. You, you try to get everything correct. You want the angle of the sun right, the shadow on the, on the rocks right. You, the, the lighting source has to be correct. Impressionistic, you, you, you give the impression and the feeling and the emotion of it. Um, then you have hardware art where you're depicting some kind of hardware. Um, the difference between a solar system art and deep space art, there's no real difference unless somebody is depicting one in photorealistic and another one is depicting it impressionistic. It's more of hmm. how far out can your imagination go and what do you want to show when you're there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the book 
describe the the transition from analog to digital scientific illustration. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just curious about your thoughts on that generally. Is that uh, you've been a space artist for a long time, so I'm assuming you've used both methods. Yep. Do you have a favorite? I do. I still absolutely love um, the feel of the paintbrush in my hand and the canvas and the smell of my oils. And it's just, it kind of gets me into my, my happy Zen state. And mm -hmm. for me, my, my analog painting uh, brush on canvas is it. I, I absolutely love it. I like the digital and, and I do produce some digital art, <clears throat> but it's not my preferred method. My preferred method is painting. But there are yeah. IAAA members who, uh, who produce only exclusively in digital, and they are so incredibly skilled. Um, <clears throat> good example, um, fellow artist uh, Mark Garlick uh, out of the UK. Uh, his digital work is just breathtaking. Um, for, for our other book, our Alien Earth, <clears throat> Mark is producing a virtual reality image of each of the places that we're going in the chapter. And mm -hmm. the, the first time that I put on virtual reality goggles and I, I loaded up the image that Mark created uh, standing on the surface of Callisto, moon of Jupiter, I would have sworn I was standing there for real. His, his work is so detailed, so vivid, so real. The hairs in the back of my neck stood up. Jupiter was hanging in the sky. I was looking around, looking up at him, looking down at the ground. Absolutely astonishing. That That is the, the step, the difference between a painting and digital, going analog to digital. And to each his own, and some are absolutely phenomenal at producing art in each of their different, uh, different types. Yeah. So there are probably people right now that, that are, or I'm sure that there are people right now that are producing art using older methods. There are people producing art using newer methods. There are people that are just thinking about producing art. So reading all this, I was just kind of curious, you know, how did you become a space artist? How does someone become a space artist? Let's say someone reads this book and becomes inspired. How, how does it, how do you get into the IAAA? Well, you know, that that's exactly how I, got inspired to be a space artist was I saw a book. Um, I'm, I'm retired military now. And one day I was at the, uh, the bookstore on my base and back in the 19, early 1990s, I'm not saying how, how long ago, I don't want to tell how old. <laughs> um, and I saw a book on the shelf called, uh, out of the cradle, uh, by William Hartman and Ron Miller, um, who are both, members of the IAAA, but the book depicted nothing but space art. It showed Earth, Mars, Jupiter, planets, moons, and stuff, and I picked it up and was absolutely gobsmacked. It was just phenomenal, incredible, and I bought it on the spot. I went home, I read through the whole thing, looked at all the paintings, went back, read through the whole book, looking at the paintings again, and I just said, I have got to do this. I've got to try to do something like this. I just, I have to, I have to try to express what this inspires in me. So I went back to the base, to the hobby shore, the hobby store, and uh, bought a bunch of paints and canvas and brushes. And I've been painting ever since. Wow. Yeah. And had you, did you have any training as a painter before that? I you did not. No, I just, I just wow. started doing it and never stopped doing it and I've gotten better and better over the years. To the point now that uh, not only am I a fellow artist in the IAAA, but uh, I'm very good friends with both Ron and and Bill Hart. And uh, I got well, to, there you go. he was he was my inspiration and my hero for this. And uh, and I had the great pleasure of sitting on the side of uh, Mount St. Helens, uh, the volcano, uh, me yeah. and Bill painting. And and I got to say, Bill, you know what? Thanks. That this is this is. <laughs> This is because of you, and now right. I'm the president of the IAAA. That's true. You're a very important person. Uh, I wouldn't nice say work. that, <laughs> but I do love. Space. But you got you got voted in, right? I did. Someone I got voted, voted in for twice, you. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, congrats. Two term. Uh, is there a term limit? Are you how long are you there for? Uh, no, no term limit. Um, just as long as I keep you know, pushing the genre of space art and uh, helping IAAA get our message out. Um, Maybe I'll keep doing it. 
Sounds good. All right. Well, you're allowed to use this as a reference well, thank next you. time you run. And my next campaign speech? I cannot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So yeah, let's talk about space hardware art for a little bit because I think that that's real interesting because that I think connects real close with uh, science and you know the new developments and there was a discussion in the book about space hardware art being influenced by what was happening in that particular time period. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, '60s art. This was you know the moon race was going on, so people were you know were painting things that kind of might might look like what was being developed. So. You know, the, the book came out a, a little while ago now, and so I'm curious about what the current stage of or status of space art is, uh, you know, given we have just huge technological advances from private companies like SpaceX, developing reusable rockets. I mean, it seems like the hardware is really growing in leaps and bounds. And do, do, do you feel like that's uh, being represented in space art, or how is, how is space hardware art changing it's changing because the, the more imagery that we get from like uh, like the Juno probe that has just recently gone into orbit around Jupiter, mm -hmm. uh, people see what our hardware is producing and it's breathtaking. You, you look at the cloud formations on Jupiter that Juno is taking from two, 3,000 miles above the, the surface and you realize that that probe is closer to Jupiter than Los Angeles is to New York. Mm. It's that close. And, and, yeah. and something that humans have created has made this incredible journey to go out there and show us these amazing sites. So the hardware art that, that is being produced nowadays uh, is getting more and more realistic. Um, we, we can download complete uh, design packages uh, of almost every probe that's ever been launched. Uh, that they get, mm -hmm. you can render it in three-dimensional um, software packages, and you can insert it into views over planets and, and places that it's going. Um, one of our members produced a, an image of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter over the Ballas Moneris, uh, Steve Hobbs, and he used a, a 3D image of the MRO probe and then painted the Ballas Marineris beneath it. And it's a beautiful image, and it shows the grandeur of what's out there and how humans can actually get to it and, and participate and see it and touch it and feel it. So hardware is, is just wonderful stuff. There's a chapter on patrons. Is, is this one of the chapters you wrote? I think it's uh, one of the last few. Yes, it is. It's the last two chapters, I believe. Yeah. So you wrote that uh, art is meant to be seen. And I thought, you know, that's that's so important. And we talked a little bit earlier about how, uh, you know, if people look at book covers or, or anything with space on there. You're, it's a IAAA member work generally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, m maybe talk a little bit about right now where some prominent places people can go to see space art and also maybe some places that are unexpectedly showcasing space art that people might not have even realized. NASA has a wonderful program um, where they have traveling displays of art created for NASA over the years. Uh, they have great displays at every one of the NASA space centers in Houston, uh, in, in uh, Cape Canaveral, uh, the National Museum, uh, Jesus in the Smithsonian, um, the National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian in uh, DC has some fantastic art. There are displays of art going on at uh, many of the colleges, many universities going around, and the IAAA actually has a, uh, a traveling show um, that is currently on display at the University of Arizona at the Osiris Rex. Um, probe headquarters. Uh, Osiris X is a probe to land on a comet and do samples and stuff. And uh, I think that's correct. You may want to double check and okay. you know, confirm that one. Uh, but Osiris Rex is a probe that, to, to study comets. And they have a, a very large display of art that's being, uh, that is set up outside their control center. Most mm -hmm. of the, uh, the ESA Space centers in, in uh, Guyana and uh, their headquarters in Germany. Uh, they have. ESA is what again for everybody? The, sorry, the European Space Agency. 
yeah, yeah. just in case. And JAXA, J-A-X-A, is the Japanese uh, Air Exploration Agency, I believe. Um, each of the, the space agencies around the world, they have large displays of art um, depicting mm-hmm. astronomical stuff, space and hardware and people. Um, they're all wonderful. And many use museums uh, around the world have selections of space art. Anywhere that you find um, um, science fiction-y type stuff, you'll frequently find uh, some kind of decent space art. I live in Seattle at the moment, and uh, the Seattle EMP um, by Paul Allen, they had a wonderful uh, display of space art in one of their their side rooms, uh, a good 40, 50 pieces of space art from his private collection. Uh, you just look for it, and you'll find it everywhere. And, and if you can't yeah. find a museum with it, um, pretty much every magazine cover that shows you any kind of astronomical display or planetary discovery or an announcement of a new exoplanet by NASA or anybody else, uh, an IAAA member has probably done the art to go along with that press release. Yeah, you guys are everywhere. Yeah, we try to be. Everywhere <laughs> in the whole universe. Everywhere, that's right. We've got it all covered. Uh, so yeah, So and, and the uh, finishing up the, the chapter tomorrow, today, it, it talks about the likelihood of alien civilizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that I am, of course, fascinated by. Yeah. I love uh, writing that chapter, by the way. I had a yeah, lot of fun right? writing that. Yeah. The Drake equation, all that good stuff. Uh, so, you know, I, and I think it's interesting because that chapter was, was, as much as it was about alien civilizations, it was also about the future of our civilization. Mm-hmm. And so I thought maybe it'd be, it'd be great to talk about how space art has helped us imagine what other civilizations might be and might look like what they might do and then how that reflects back on us the one really key thing about the universe is that everything happens the same way everywhere gravity makes rocks fall sunlight reflects off of rocks or off of snow water freezes at the same temperature um Atmosphere reflects light or absorbs light, uh, depending upon the chemicals that make it up. So no matter where in the universe you are, the physics behind the universe is still the same. So an artist can imagine himself standing on the surface of a planet two billion light years away from here and know that the light in this angle is going to create a shadow this long from a rock this tall. You know it. So you can imagine these wonderful places and know that you can see it and depict it and know that it's right. Know that what you're showing could actually be real. And knowing this and knowing that science works the same on Earth as it does on Mars, that somebody somewhere like the Drake equation shows, somebody somewhere is also thinking that same thought and they're gonna build things the same way that people do. They're gonna build a bridge because a bridge is gonna bridge you across rivers. You're gonna build it the same way, whether you've got 10 fingers and, and two hands or whether you've got eight fingers in each hand or whatever, a bridge is still gonna be a bridge. A building is still gonna be a building. It's still gonna be built the same way. Science works everywhere the same. And you can depict how that science does things in your own imaginative way in these faraway places. And that's the inspiration. You know what you can imagine could be real and you want to go see it. Yeah. So let's segue a little bit now into the, uh, to your new book. Mm-hmm. So why don't you, we've talked a little bit about it, but why don't you talk a little bit more about the new book, where people can find parts of it and how they can make it be. Well, it's funny enough, um, the new book called Our Alien Earth, um, and it depicts these alien places, uh, as I was just saying, some, uh, science, physics works the same everywhere. It, it, the alien Earth shows that there are places on Earth that look the same as places off of Earth. A geyser on Triton works for the same reasons that a geyser on Earth does. 
Um, Gravens on Mars look almost identical to Gravens on Earth because they were formed by the same process. So I can paint what Mars looks like by standing in a Graben in Iceland and saying, this is what it looks like. And I know that it looks like this because I can see pictures that probes have returned and show me that it looks exactly the same. Um, The funny thing is that our alien Earth was inspired by the beauty of space. And Mm. specifically uh, uh, in the, let's see what page, uh, page 53, um, I did a section of that chapter as well about the spires of Callisto. Because, and the spires of Callisto look very, very much like the spires of Cappadocia in Turkey. And I went to Cappadocia twice and went crawling amongst these spires. And I had this eerie thought in my head that I was standing on Callisto and that the moon in the sky in the evening wasn't the moon, it was Jupiter. Hmm. And that that feeling and, and that similarity made it into, and, and the art and the pictures of that made it into the beauty of space. But that idea of places out there look the same as the places here, um, it stuck with me. It stuck with other people in the IAAA. And that, that germinated, that seed germinated and became the idea for our alien Earth. And now we're, we're producing our alien Earth. Now, when we did our beauty, the beauty of space, uh, we did it through Kickstarter. We did a, a fundraiser through Kickstarter. And we actually uh, set our goal uh, and made it in less than 24 hours for the money to publish the book. Uh, we ended up making five and a half times our goal because people are really inspired by by space art and want to hold something that they can look at and, and, and read it and treasure it for years to come. Um, so we decided we wanted to do another crowdfunding uh, fundraiser and for our alien earth. And now we're doing it through the Patreon website, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Patreon website. And you can uh, go to www.patreon.com and search for me, John, J-O-N, Raymer, R-A-M-E-R, or Our Alien Earth, and you'll find uh, the website there. Uh, So far, we've got uh, three chapters uh, where we go to some place on Earth and some place out in the solar system, and we show why they're the same and, more importantly, why they're different, show you pictures of what it looks like on Earth, and then paintings of what it looks like out there. And, uh, mm-hmm. and as I said earlier, uh, we have a virtual reality image of each of those locations done by Mark Garlick, uh, showing you, if you put on your VR goggles, what it's like to stand there. And they're just absolutely amazing. Yeah, that sounds very powerful. Yeah, really. So, it, and the way it works is people contribute to the Patreon and they get chapters as they come out yes that's exactly correct uh they can contribute a dollar a month i mean come on one dollar a month what, what is that that's that, that's not even a, a half a cup of starbucks coffee right <laughs> you know one dollar a month and you get the chapter uh, written with all of the photographs and all of the stories and all the information and all of the art or if you want you can do two dollars a month and you can get the virtual reality uh to go with it and then there are, of course, like other crowdfunding things, there are, there are more levels that you can donate, $5 or $10 a month. And uh, at the end of our 18-month uh, journey around the solar system to all these places, we're going to hopefully have enough funds raised and uh, publish the book. And if you're a $10 a month patron, um, you get an autographed copy of the book, just mm. as being a patron. Right. And so the idea is to... Uh, to Print this book, uh, at least a thousand copies of it, and then here's the real nice kicker: if there's enough money left over, we'll do a second printing of the Beauty of Space, and uh-huh. that more people out there uh, can have access to both books. Yeah, I was about to say. So this is this Beauty of Space book I've got here is out of print, huh? So yes, this it is. is. A rare, <clears throat> rare collectible. Yeah, it is. We had uh, five hundred something and a few extra copies produced, and they sold out. Boom. And in yeah. literally in two months flat. Yeah. Now I was there. I was one of the early backers. Yeah. That's good stuff. It's wonderful. All Thank right. So, um, yeah. 
So you just kind of wrapping things up here. Is there is there anything else I always like to ask? Is there are there any other lessons or takeaways or anything you hoped readers of this book might might glean that we haven't quite covered yet? Space is a wonderful, incredible, vast, beautiful place. And it is humanity's ultimate destiny. We were not born to live and die in this one tiny planet around one tiny star in a galaxy of 200 billion stars and trillions of galaxies in this universe. Mm. Our destiny is out there. And hopefully the books like uh, The Beauty of Space and Our Alien Earth inspire people to want to go and see these amazing places and see what the universe has to offer us. Sounds great. I think you're well on your way to that goal. We hope so. Uh, so let's, ra- yeah. So let's wrap up with just a couple of fun questions, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Sure. And I, I always like love to ask my my little thunder round questions here. So I'll start off with, what's your favorite food or drink? My favorite food? Oh, clearly one thing above all: Alaskan king crab leg. Ooh! Love. Wow. I'm, I'm, That's uh, some fine taste. Yeah. Well, I'm fortunate in that the company that I work with now, uh, one of our partners actually owns a portion of a, an Alaskan king crabbing vessel. So wow. uh, he sets us up really good. That sounds nice. Uh, they're delicious. Absolutely love them. All right. Fair deal. What about uh, my second question is, where's your favorite place you've ever been? Sounds like you've been to a lot of places. So Yeah. that's. Um, can I just say planet Earth? Call it. <laughs> you sure can. Yeah, um, it's, my, it's a great answer. Yeah, I'm. I'm a retired military, and in my military career, I uh, uh, I stopped counting countries that I'd been to when it went over fifty because I figured it just didn't matter mm-hmm. after fifty, and that happened back in the nineties. So, I, I've been to six of the seven continents. I've been to the North Pole. I've been to the lowest point on Earth. I haven't been to the highest point on Earth or the South Pole. I've been to all seven seas. Um, if I had to pick any one place that was just the most magical of all, I would have to say Uluru in Australia. I lived in Australia for two years, and uh, Ayers mm-hmm. Rock was just amazing place to be, especially at sunrise. Okay. I'll have to take a look. Never heard. Yeah, Ayers Rock. Um, so... Air's Rock, got it. And so my last question is, if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? I would wave the magic wand and I would create a all-temperature superconducting material. Mm. And the reason, yeah, the reason behind it is with an all-temperature superconducting material, you could uh, create batteries that store electricity at no loss and instantly recharge and are 100% efficient. You can create transmission wires that can go across the country with no loss of electricity. You can create uh, solar panel cells that are 100% efficient and then run the panel electricity from New Mexico uh, up to New York and have no loss. You can put panels on the roofs of every house and solve the energy crisis. But more importantly, Mm. with a superconducting material, you can create things uh, like space elevators. You can use electricity to make a space elevator rigid enough to sustain the weight and get into orbit for no cost, you know, effectively the cost of sunlight falling out of the sky. Um, A a superconducting material that works at all temperatures, not just super cold, but room temperature and warm, um, would literally be a, a revolution in human affairs. It would change every aspect of human society for the better. Sounds good. Great answer. Thank you. All right. Well, <laughs> my guest again, John Raymer, uh, editor, writer, The Beauty of Space was the old book. The new book, Our Alien Earth, is available on Patreon. Go look John Raymer, Our Alien Earth up. John, just want to say thanks so much for taking the time. This was a great talk. Thanks very much. Uh, Wonderful chatting with you. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. 
And so it goes. 